All right, welcome in, welcome in. It is Monday morning, the 25th, and it's time for an episode of Broncos for Breakfast. I am Nick Kendall, and joined by, as always, on these morning shows, Scott Kennedy. Scott, how are you? Did you have a good weekend? And uh, happy owners meetings. We're getting some... Uh, I'm really happy that uh, Sean Payton was having his interview at 4.50 a.m. my time today, because that was when I was starting to wake up and uh, get everything ready for the day. So got a little bit we can talk about with Sean Payton today. Yeah, nice having uh, some new content for sure. And he had a, a pre-interview with Denver Broncos media yesterday and talked a little bit. Uh, didn't say a whole lot, but you know, there's there is some news coming out. And happy to get into it. Glad you're here with us on a pretty nice Monday morning here in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it is. Uh, I know some some folks were getting some snow as well. So this beautiful country of ours, it's lots to choose from when it comes to uh, topography and climate. Yeah, and I totally skip, skip there on a second for those uh, Facebook groups, so click them in, and uh, hopefully you guys are joining us now. Scott, I started the coffee this morning, and I did not have the pot underneath. If that tells you my uh, my mental state right now, I hear like splashing. I'm like, wait a second. Shh, bleep. God bless it. Uh, so uh, we're here. We're live, and uh, we got uh, William Hayes saying it's not MHH without being 25 minutes late. We're not 25 minutes late. And I know. If you want to hang out, pretty sure that you uh, also scheduled it for 45 for a quarter I, till. I said 35. Okay. But uh, that's okay. Um, we, if you've missed us so much, come over and hang out on Monday mornings. We're doing the Falcons show uh, before we come on over here. So uh, we, uh, you know, I already talked about a little bit Sean Payton uh, before coming don't, over here. William, don't make me send Ninja after you. <laughs> he will come and get you. Ninja, it's not Ninja time today. You're going to have to go find someone else to bother for a little while. No, dad. <laughs> so pre yeah, he's, uh, he's gotten needy. That's okay. I'm Me too. Blurry. So we'll get it Come going on. here. We got Jeremy in the house too. As Scott figures out his blurs, the black cat kind of threw things up there. Uh, says morning boys. We draft a quarterback in the first. How do you feel about pairing him with a college teammate? Uh, gives a lot of options there. I don't think it matters too much. Uh, honestly, if you can get guys in here, uh, especially the one that I would make maybe would make some sense would be, I think maybe some of the wide receiver to quarterback combination there. So like uh, Nix and uh, Franklin make some sense to me. Uh, McCarthy with Roman Wilson. Yeah, yeah, it is some there, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot of time to work on chemistry and reps before the season starts anyway. So it's, I think it's more important to get good players in there than try to double up and get somebody with familiarity in there. Like it works. It works great, Scott. When the two you're talking about pairing are uh, Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow, right? yeah, like, when they're when they're both really good, but you know they they hit it off. And frankly, a lot of these guys, Jeremy, they know each other already. They've yeah. been on the camp circuit since freshman in high school, where they're doing Nike camps, they're doing Elite Elevens, they're doing passing leagues, they're doing they're doing uh, their college camps together in the summertime. Well, they'll pair this guy and that guy. So I don't I don't think it makes too big of a difference where a lot of them are friends and they become quickly become friends uh, as soon as they are teammates as well. Like, hey, we'd love to have you. So there's, there's a lot of familiarity with today's ease of information and ease of conversations that I don't, I don't think it's, it's too big a deal. It's just, it's more important to say best guy, best guy. That's how you're going to develop chemistry out there. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Nick. Good players. Don't overthink it. Um, maybe if it's something where you have guys like rated almost exactly the same, it could be a tiebreaker, but I think scheme fit and, you know, stuff, the role is going to be more important than that. Oblivion Empire coming in from the Falcons side, coming over to support the Broncos. God bless you. OE says, let's have a wonderful day. week, guys support these hosts. They are great uh, by smashing that like button. Thank you so much for the uh, publicity there, Oblivion. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful day and week as well. We got to David Youngkin saying morning boys center. Alex Forsyth play with Knicks. Uh, Sean. Didn't say anything in his press conference. I mean, there's some inf inf interesting information. We'll get into it, what Sean had to say. Joel coming in says, I think Sean is sending smoke screens. Nix is his guy. will be trading down a lot in rounds three and after. Definitely think it's possible that the Broncos trade down from 12. Maybe Nix is his guy or a guy they're targeting there. I think probably if they're so sold on Nix that they can't imagine a world without him, that you probably just got to take him at 12 and, you know, be damned what, people like me have to say, you know, you got to, I trust, got to tr trust his own gut. Sean's got to trust his own gut there. Uh, but maybe it's something where, you know, you have a Bonix caliber prospect in the draft almost every year, uh, that kind of range in player profile and you still target him. You like him. 
but you can live in a reality where you don't get them. I think that's probably reality for the Broncos, but we'll see. Uh, who knows? Nick's has a lot of good stuff for him in terms of the overall athleticism, the frame, the ability to hit that first read when it's open and uh, a lot of uh, good mental uh, stuff as well. So, you know, if he's killing it in the whiteboard session and they're impressed with the, the makeup of the guy, then definitely uh, I could see that happening. Yeah, I agree. Um, if, if he's your, you don't trade down if you like the guy, you know, I, I'm not well, risking it. I think love is the word. Yeah. If like well, but if, if, the, if yeah. he's your guy, he's your guy, you take yes. him, you know, risk, whatever backlash be damned. All that goes away with winning. doesn't matter where you take him. People may say, oh, this was too early. And a lot of people aren't saying it's too early for any, they're saying it might be too early for anybody, but the Denver Broncos. But if, if he's your guy, he's your guy. So we'll see. The one that feels like a little bit to me was was the uh, the comments, Nick, that trading up to three, top three, is realistic. It is, but to get someone to answer the phone, your opening is going to be 2024, number 12, 2025, number one, and Pat Sertan. That's going to get someone on the phone. Mm-hmm. So are you willing to give up all of that for one of your quarterbacks? Then it's re- it's soup. It's absolutely realistic. It's just expensive. Absolutely expensive. Yeah. I mean, I think talking about everything that I've heard, Sertan is probably not being moved, but would the, how are you going to get into the top three? Otherwise, uh, three first round picks might, it'd have to be the Trey Lance package in the end. And it was going to, I mean, you're already at such a deficit. I would think it would be too expensive for me to go up there and get that, but you're talking about, uh, but I'm sitting there at 11. I'm the Minnesota Vikings. I want that spot. I'm offering you 11 and 23 this year. And my number one next year, and I'm going to be playing with a rookie quarterback. So guess what? We're, I'm, I'm, I'm either playing with Sam Darnold or a rookie quarterback. So guess what? Your number one in 2025 is going to be top 10. Also. I don't know if that's true for Minnesota, but you know uh, what I mean? That's what I'm selling. Yeah. I think that if I was another team, I would be very, much interested in the Broncos 2025 first based on how I perceive <laughs> the talent level on this team right now in the division that they're in, in the AFC. Uh, but that's just me. So the Broncos will be, as you mentioned here, uh, Ian Rappaport, shout out to him for the good question. Uh, he asked uh, how realistically would it be for the Broncos to trade up? And Sean replied with realistic. Uh, he also said they'll look into it and noted it's a good time to be Mon- Monty uh, right now. Monty Ossenfort, who's the general manager of the Cardinals, uh, says hard to know what the, it will eventually cost. So I agree with you, Scott. It's going to be pretty damn hard to outbid the Minnesota Vikings. But there's pro- I mean, just kind of like we saw with the Vikings, with the Kirk Cousins, the Falcons stuff. There's probably a point where if the Broncos really want them, they still can do it. Now, I wouldn't do it because it'd be costly to the point that too many eggs in a basket where historically we know the hit rate there is really high. It's one reason that you know, it might've been nice to lose a few more games this year and end up with like the fifth pick rather than the 12th, uh, where we're at. But, uh, that's a, uh, the route reality we're in right now. So, uh, we'll see what happens. Mike Gibbons coming in 1999. God bless you, Mike. He says, good morning. Love you guys. Well, Mike, we love you. All the super chat folks keeping the lights on in here, making it uh, a little bit more feasible for me to be like, babe, I got to keep the live streams going, uh, because the people love us. No, they got, we're bringing in a little money here. Uh, so, it's sometimes a little frustrating, like, oh, you're going to leave me with a baby and then go to work. It's like, well, this is a job, too. So uh, thanks for people like Mike for uh, making it uh, <laughs> a, a good rebuttal for me to keep it going here. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you for sure. Love that Broncos orange. David Cremello coming in with uh, the, the super chat and is yellow. He says, well, Lindsey Jones's comments aren't exactly inaccurate. I think the Broncos do have some clarity of direction and that they're finally doing an actual rebuild. What do you think? I agree with you. I think there's probably more they could do to tear it down, but I think they are absolutely throwing out the signals that we are going to enter a rebuild. Now, would you like to have some more draft picks? Yes, you would. Uh, But can you still get some more before the draft? Yes, you can. Have you set yourself up to be out from under Russell Wilson's salary cap hit after one year? For the most part, you get money back next year. You get almost $25 million back next year with him being gone. So it's a salary. It's a, it's a net positive on the salary cap. You're in cap hell for one year. That's it. As long as you remain patient, frugal, so to speak, which isn't always the right thing to do. 
And then it's hard to say, yes, we are remaining patient and frugal and dropping three first round draft picks on a quarterback. Nick. <laughs> I, I just couldn't do it. Uh, if you could get up for Caleb Williams, I would do it, uh, but that's not happening. I love Drake May. I don't think I'd do that with that. How I'd tier this quarterback class right now is Caleb would be tier one. Drake would be tier two. Those two guys would be on their own tier alone. Tier three for me would be like, if they're there at 12, I take them. I don't love trading up. And that would be McCarthy and Daniels. And then tier four is the pick 25 through 60 range. I'm like, okay, I I'm okay with it here in uh Knicks Rattler and Penix, but that's just me. It's okay. If you have a different evaluation, time will show that I'm going to miss probably 40% of that uh, because that's what the NFL shows at his rate. And as far as uh, David's comment here, he's talking about Lindsey Jones. I think it was on the ringer talking about the teams that feel like they're in no man's land. And she said that the team that she's fading and probably one of the worst in the NFL this year is the Broncos given their free agency and the overall talent on the roster right now. Uh, we do have Sean Payton today saying um, in the owner's meeting interview that uh, dismissing that this is a rebuilding year for the team. He said, that nobody will say a rebuild. What was that? They won't say rebuild. They that, won't. That say word it. was banned again. Nick and I have some experience going through this because we did it on the Falcons podcast for the last three years. And we watched them do it. And that's also one of the problems I have with a 2026 number one, Nick. Yep. There's no guarantee anybody making that trade is going to have a job mm -hmm. in 2026 on either side. Yeah. So let's say I'm making that trade with the Cardinals. How secure is that general manager? Can he, can he afford to wait for 2026 to reap the rewards of that trade when he could have it immediately and help his team right now with, uh, with, you know, two number ones from the Vikings. So, I think that becomes a little a little more sketchy on that. So, but David, yeah, the uh, Nick, I don't know if you saw Bleacher Report did a one word to sum up every team so far, and they'd put in exciting or something like that, and then they'd usually write a paragraph underneath it explaining that. And for the Denver Broncos, it said sacrificial, and it says two twenty twenty five says thanks. Well, that's assuming you're keeping up keeping that twenty twenty five pick. Yeah. And it's hard because of where the quarterback draft class looks like for 2025 right now. Just in general, I mean, you look at last, typically every year you can like kind of see some of the stars coming on the horizon. It's a hard time with 2025 uh, right now. Um, so there's a, there's a perfect example of like the, the Carolina Panthers have turned into the Cleveland Browns. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everything they do recently just turns to crap. You know, do you want to be the Carolina Panthers where you draft, you trade up for a quarterback and put him in a bad situation. And now the quarterback that goes after him, one of these guys is in a better situation and has success. And then you turn around and watch your number one become a top two or three pick in the next year. And meanwhile, you still don't know if you've got even got the right quarterback. It's, it's just, it's so expensive to come up for a quarterback. The risk I'm too conservative for that. I don't gamble because I know math way too well. <laughs> and and gambling, you know, polka is an honest game. But uh, you know, the the gaming stuff like um, you know, the craps tables, all this is blackjack. The odds are all in the house. The the probability on hitting is just so expensive to give up that many high picks to know. You give me three first round picks, I'm gonna come out of there with a player for sure. You go three for one, I don't know for sure that one is gonna be the guy. Yeah, and we got uh, Sean Burns coming in, says out of all the players supposedly going in the top 10, we'll see who they are, but who's most likely to be a bust? Uh, to me, guys who I think have high bust potential, I think that Jaden Daniels has high bust potential. Is, is a guy getting injured bust potential? No, There's it's not. Okay, well, his playing style to me lends it, and his frame lend itself to being more injury prone. Uh, it's kind of an RG3 example there. So Unless I worry he was already having injury problems before and you ignored them. Okay. Well, it's more of then a, it's on you. It's more of a style and frame perspective for me. Uh, the other thing about Jane Daniels is it sounds like he's probably going to, if he goes two or three, the commander's offense and the Patriots offense are pretty terrible. Uh, I don't really, I don't love the situation. Defensive head coaches as well for both of those guys, both of those teams. And he was throwing to two top 20 picks. I mean, you talk about, or I, think, I don't know if it was this show or the last one, that uh, Caleb Williams goes one almost any year, dating back to besides Trevor Lawrence's draft. I think you have, uh, oh my gosh, names escape. Malik Neighbors is like the number one wide receiver almost. I mean, he'd have been in there with the Jamar Chase conversation uh, dating back a few years. They also had Brian Thomas, and they have two 
top 40 picks at offensive tackle in the next season as well. Uh, so I kind of worry about Jane Daniels. I think that uh, Lamar Jackson walks so Jaden could run, but he's not the same caliber of athlete or passer uh, that Lamar Jackson was coming out. So I'm, I'm fading uh, Jaden Daniels as that, like it seems like he's emerging as the number two consensus guy. And I just, I don't know. I've been wrong before. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, I, I could be wrong again. Another one that kind of concerns me, uh, Scott is Dallas Turner. Uh, just because I have some L- Lorenzo Carter, no man's land kind of vibes. Like, Oh, is he better as a pass, like a, a pass rusher who can get out in space? Cause he's a good athlete. You don't always see the consistency as a pass rusher. And it's nice to be, hybrid to an extent, but sometimes it makes you a little bit murky in your projection to the league. One thing I will say about Dallas Turner though, that despite being a little bit smaller and you know, this athlete where he can play in space, he can rush is that he's an absolute bulldog setting the edge. Uh, despite his frame, he is physical as a, as an edge setter. So you have that going for you, but those are two that I'm like, I have a, some questions about the projection. And Sean, I was just going to say it real quick. Two of the four quarterbacks. If yeah. four quarterbacks go in the top 10, two of them are probably going to bust. That's just the way it is, man. It's very rare that all of the quarterbacks hit. So last year, there were three in the top 10. And is is Anthony Richardson a bust because of he was being injured? No, he looked pretty good. CJ Stroud, bona fide hit. And the, the jury is still out. But, you know, you're, you've are you got a, an F at the first break in the semester on on Bryce Young Uh, I like Bryce Young we'll see but I was Sean I was just going to say flat out two of the top quarterbacks because those are the guys that they they're higher risk and again three first round picks for a quarterback when quarterbacks are high risk period you know again you got quarterbacks playing 15 years now you might might get two starting quarterbacks out of a draft class every year and there's 30 quarterbacks right there there's there's all of your your starters over the course of a 15 year cycle. So that's where I was going to go with that one. Michael Ronquillo, the sunrise. You can see the sun coming in on my window right here, shining from over here. He says, Good morning, Nick and Scott on Broncos for breakfast. Go Broncos. Good to see you, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. And David came in back to back. Appreciate you, David. He says, Sometimes the quickest path from going from is from eight to nine wins to 12 is being terrible. Ryan Poles knew this, and the Broncos would be wise to learn. When was Ryan Poles hired? Because the Denver, the uh, the Chicago Bears haven't won. <laughs> they haven't won ten or more games since 2018, and they've only won ten or more games once in the last eleven years. Sometimes being terrible is just being terrible. But yeah, you you've got to you either got to get lucky in the back end of the draft with your quarterback, you know, where you're not drafting in the top five and you get a franchise guy. And one of those guys that you take later on ends up being the dude. It happens, but you got to keep shooting or, you know, sometimes you, you, you Tim Duncan, this thing, and you've already got David Robinson. You have one bad year and you win the lottery. And now you get to pair both of those guys together. You might not be even know what that is, Nick. That I was, do. I do. <laughs> Spurs. The Spurs are this awesome team. David Robinson gets hurt for a season. They end up tanked and then win the lottery. Now they got David Robinson and Tim Duncan. I mean, it's Peyton Manning to Andrew Luck, right? That kind yeah. of thing. Oh, we're dominant for years. Oh, now we suck. The year Andrew Luck's coming out. Oh, no. <laughs> um, that's a... Yeah, that's who knows what happens. Uh, Troy Boer coming in. Love Troy. Hope you're doing well, guy. Says, hey, guys, if you were told four years from now that one one day three quarterback from this year's draft was a big success, who would you predict it would be? Oh, my God. Um, Man, I have the issue with this, Troy, is that the quarterbacks who are day three guys now, a lot of times are going back to college because there's so much money to be made at NIL. So I almost wonder that the young upside quarterback might evaporate a little bit day three because the guys that are coming out are going to be the ones that have completely exhausted their eligibility uh, in college football. So uh, I'd have to look at the list of names uh, still standing out here to, I mean, when that comes to mind, I'm looking at them right now and I've got two, one that stands out for me and somebody that had a lot of hype two years ago, um, but then had injury, didn't really live up to it this last season, but the the team was an absolute freaking mess around him on the offensive side of the ball is uh, Devin O'Leary at uh, North Carolina State to Kentucky. 
uh, watched him at the uh, combine and I thought he was really impressive. Now, granted that's throwing on air. How well does that translate? But he's got enough tools uh, there where it's like, okay, he's, he's going to have a cup of coffee in the league. Uh, so he's one that stands out for me. Now this is me kind of, you know, I've liked Devin Leary dating back to prior or the end of the uh, 2022 season. Uh, but that's one who stands out for me that I think maybe could be somebody. I went to, uh, cause I haven't watched nearly as much college football as you have. So I'm just going on one on a guy who's slipping because of injury. And I would say Jordan Travis. I don't say Spencer Rattler. Cause I think he goes day two. I, I think he's, he, I don't think he goes out of the third. If he goes out of the fourth, him or the, yeah, if he goes into the fourth, that's my answer, but I don't say Spencer Rattler. Cause I think he's a day two guy. So Jordan Travis, Florida state quarterback, and then Joe Milton. Joe Milton is a wildly risky prospect because of his accuracy issues. But as far as prototype size and arm strength, he's it. He's got it. That's what you're looking for. But he will fall because he's inconsistent as heck. But he's got the tools. Am I going to, if I'm going to risk a guy, I'm going to risk a guy with a 100 mile an hour fastball that has control issues. If I can teach him control, you can't teach a 100 mile an hour fastball. You know, he's six five and with a cannon for an arm, but he's he's in, he's inconsistent. But if all that comes together, he's he's a pretty good prospect. The other one who stands out for me that again, we're talking day three. So don't say Nick Kendall loves this guy. I'm evaluating him as a day three quarterback. <laughs> uh, but there was some flashes from him in college with accuracy, and he's quite the athlete. Uh, honestly, is a uh, Caden Slovis, uh, USC out then to BYU, and he tested phenomenally at the combine. So at least you have like there's the athleticism raises the floor. And a lot of times you talk ceiling, but I think the athleticism raises the floor because you can fall back on these things. Uh, so Devin Leary, not O'Leary, excuse me, and uh, Caden Slovis are two day three guys to stand out. I don't, I'm not including Milton. I think Milton's going to work his way in the top 100. Uh, really? Or- I think somebody's going to take a shot on the tools there back end. I think, I think so. Uh, but those are two names uh, that stand out for me, Leary and uh, Slovis. Okay. Good shot. Great question. Troy certainly appreciate it. Speaking of appreciation, Mark Schrader's coming in with the super chat that Broncos orange. He says, good morning, Nick and Scott. Good morning to you, Mark. Thank you for the support as always been with us from the very beginning. And we're probably into year four of this podcast now, Nick. I think we started about this time in 2021, so we are in our fourth year of doing Broncos for Breakfast, and it's uh, become pretty darn successful because of people like you, Mark, so thank you so much. Keith Brugman in as well. He says, gentlemen, cheers. Uh, I finished my coffee already, so I'll drink to that. He says, uh, Garrett Bowles, uh, Cortland Sutton, and DJ Jones, how safe are those three likely to be on the roster next year with free agent mostly in the books, with free agency mostly in the books? So how how likely are are those guys to be on the roster in 2024 each one of those have very flexible contracts very flexible contracts i think that it's going to very much depend on the how the draft falls uh, right now because it's a really good tackle and wide receiver class but there's going to be teams that want to have options to fill those positions that miss on them in the draft due to circumstances. So then you could see a bump up in interest from those guys. DJ Jones, I think he's probably the least likely to be on the roster right now. I think the Broncos are still looking at interior defensive line. If they can walk out with a couple people, maybe they move on from Jones. But all of these players, as long as their contracts are not touched, which they haven't been, we shift them to trade deadline uh, watch kind of guys where you're not going to get, especially for DJ Jones, you're not going to get huge return, but better than the outright release. Uh, so that's what I'm. That's where I'm at right now with these ones. Let me change this a little bit, because this is a great question, and the way you just said that, I really like it. So, Keith, I'm going to change this question up a little bit. Nick, how likely are these guys to finish 2024 as Denver Broncos? I think just based on what we've seen trade market-wise historically, if there is a trade that's going to happen, I think Bulls is the least likely moved in season. You don't see offensive linemen moved mm-hmm. in season very often, but you do see defensive linemen. We saw that last year with the Broncos. We saw multiple teams do that. And then wide receivers uh, moved a lot during the trade deadline. I mean, recent example for the Broncos, we saw Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders moved in successive seasons before the trade deadline. So with from George Payton. Uh, so I think that if it's an in-season move, 
probably Bulls is the safest with Sutton and Jones more likely on the move, but we'll see what happens. Uh, we still have to lead up to the draft. I th- and then after the draft, if again, let's say the Titans are sitting there and they really want to left tackle, uh, but it doesn't work out that way. Are they absolutely like, oh my gosh, Malik Neighbors is here for us at seven? Zoink, they, that's mine. Well, we're Zoink. not going to. You've been watching Instagram. <laughs> that's mine. Thank you. Carrot uh, fishing guy. Do you all know what the Zoink is? The Zoink guy. He's oh uh, yes, he's, in, in he's the awesome. Uh, in the Everglades, yeah, um, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, love the nature stuff, but yeah, no, grab. No, it's yoink. Grab, it's not zoink. It's yoink. Yoink. Yep, yoink. Yeah. That's now I screwed it all up. Nice, Scott. <laughs> yoink. Uh, but uh, then uh, maybe you see Bulls moved for a twenty twenty five pick, something like that. So I think for Sutton and Bulls, we're on the post draft watch now. Uh, Jones still want to see how free agency plays out. Yeah, for me, I think Sutton's the safest, just because. He's the only one under contract in 2025. I still have a hard time picturing Garrett Bowles playing on this team, Nick, on a $20 million cap hit. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. In the final year of his contract, when he could walk for nothing next year. It's like, what, what's the point? I mean, this isn't, we're not quite talking Garrett uh Brian Burns here. You're not gonna franchise tag the guy. He's made one Pro Bowl. So he's a $20 million guy, the final year of his contract. If he hasn't given you any indications that he wants to sign a new contract, why am I bringing him back? Why wouldn't I take the $16 million or more if I can if I can pull a trade and pick up a couple of, of picks? It just doesn't make sense to me all that, that he is there. DJ Jones isn't overly expensive. There's flexibility there, but I think you feel like you can get $13 million of value for him. And I can still knock his number down a lot if I sign him to a, a one-year extension. But he's a free agent after this year. But Bowles, if he has some trade value, he has $16-plus plus million in cap savings. If he hasn't given you any indication that he wants to come back to be a Denver Bronco, doesn't make any sense to me that he is on this roster under the current contract next year. Yeah. None. With all the financial stuff that you did uh, to create room, He's one that I wouldn't be shocked if there was a new deal in place at some point, but they have flexibility where they it's kind of a staring contest now and the we're playing chicken. And with all the moves they made with the salary cap, you gave yourself a little bit more room, more roadway for that chicken game. Uh, so <laughs> we'll see what plays out there. I would be surprised as well, but you have the cap space now where you have the ability to sit there and wait. Mm-hmm. Uh, so We'll see. Um, it's definitely a good question. We got Gary Kuhn coming in four ninety nine. Thank you so much, Gary, for keeping the lights on and keeping uh, this uh, newborn dad here and doing these morning shows. Let me tell you, it's it's hard some mornings, <laughs> but uh, we're here. We're excited and we're loving talking ball. Uh, Scott, the uh, Broncos Twitter account just released a really interesting uh, graphic of a uh, stitching going on a uniform saying new threads coming soon. So uh, we have the official confirmation, new jerseys, and the logo looks like the old logo, which Makes me sad because I am very much a fan of the old school uh, logo, as you can see there. Uh, but uh, that's okay. Um, we'll see what happens with the new uniforms coming in here. But it's officially official. We're going to have something dropped here sometime soon. Yeah, I like the the Denver D. I, I'm I'm. I mean, it was all right with the Chargers, but that's basically a Bronco Charger with the with the strata. I don't dislike it, but I like the the old school uniforms where there was just so much more Character. differentiation. Let me spit that out right. There, each team was so much more unique. Now you can turn on the game and it takes you a second. Wait a minute, who's who's playing? Is that the 49ers or the Buccaneers? You know, and it's just I don't like it. Everybody's starting to look the same. Look like they look like they're AI generated <laughs> logos off the same template a lot of times. Uh, I just yep. I don't know. I'm not a fan of the the. Uh, the dragon horse as much, but I mean, it's, it's our team. So you still like it, but uh, that's uh, I definitely like the character of the older ones. Uh, if everybody could just go back to their 1980s uniforms, that'd be great. Uh, Gary Palmer says, good morning, Nick and Scott, just the best go Broncos. Well, Gary, you're the best. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good weekend and uh, hope the rest of your week's good for you as well. Appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Shoot. As fast as time's going, we're not too far away from meet and greet coming up hope to see you again this year, Gary. And you know, we'll, the, we drop that. When's the meet and greet? We usually figure that out the day after the schedule drops. Mm-hmm. We pick it out. So I think the Atlanta Falcons are coming to uh, coming to Atlanta, and we can might be able to have a big Falcons podcast MHH mashup. That could be kind of fun with yeah. uh, if the if uh, if we travel that weekend for sure. 
Uh, Rob, very similar sentiments. Thank you. You flatter us. Rob Bucksbaum. Good morning, Nick and Scott. The best MHH team. A lot of good ones out there. Always better days when you guys are on in the morning. We'll appreciate it. Y'all certainly pick up my day. That's for sure. Little little Lions coffee and some MHH podcasts. Makes me feel a lot better right away. So appreciate you having Nick. Do you need a second? What are you looking at? You, you got something on your mind. Me, I was just looking at uh, some more of the Sean Payton uh, interview that we had going on. And he talked a lot about uh, the Broncos center. There's going to be a competition with anybody on the roster right now. He said, for now, it's Wattenberg versus Forsyth. So the Broncos are still, you know, looking at, they're not so sold on those two that they're not evaluating the options in the draft, it seems like. Uh, he also mentioned that the Broncos are still, you know, talking with a few free agents and uh, they're going to hopefully meet with some representation here down at the uh, the Senior Bowl, or excuse me, at the <laughs> Senior Bowl, at the owners meeting. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see if they can work something out here. We're kind of in, you know, wave three of free agency now, so nothing big. Uh, he did mention, talking about uh, Malcolm Roach, saying he could envision him playing 40 snaps a game, I believe was what he said. Yeah, 35 to 40 snaps a game. And he also spoke very, high, very highly of the Broncos' uh, new safety coming in as well, saying he's versatile and complete either spot. And they envisioned P.J. Locke and uh, Jones playing safety, but there's still opportunities for the other safeties in the room, such as a Stearns and a uh, Skinner. So interesting to follow, and we got a bunch of information there from guys on the team right now. Yeah, when you're talking about you know the opportunity there, P.J. Locke coming in, he played well last year, and then uh, Jones was a pretty high price free agent coming in replacing Justin Simmons. Now, who else wants to step up? I think it's very good coming in with no expectations. And Lawrence comes in with some stars. He says, who's the designer? Uh, I don't know if it's Nike that does all those. You feel like the team would have some input on those as well. But with with football kits, soccer kits, you, jerseys, it's pretty much up to the who owns the, the rights. And those are all individual because they're individual clubs, not franchises of a bigger league. So who's a designer? Maybe Nike. I don't. I don't know on those for sure. Lawrence, it's Nike. Uh, not one of the things I typically pay that much attention to. You're saying forty snaps a game, right? Thirty-five so, to forty is what they said for Roach. So snap counts in seventeen games. Jonathan Harris had five hundred and twenty-nine snaps in seventeen games. It said Jonathan Harris only got five starts. It seemed like you know. Again, we talk about base this, base that. You're in sub package so often. And by the end of the season, he wasn't getting a ton of starts. But if you talk 529 divided by 17 games, 17 games is 31 snaps per game for Jonathan Harris. Can you improve on Jonathan Harris? Would you rather have Roach in there for John? I don't know a whole lot about Roach, and I'd rather have him in there for Jonathan Harris. I think Roach is probably a little bit more eating into the snaps of Mike Purcell than Jonathan Harris, but we'll see. We also have a Wazarike who's going to play into the mix and the Broncos sound like they're still very much looking at interior defensive linemen in the draft or in free agency. So that this room is not done yet. Uh, continuing on information from this interview uh, with uh, Sean Payton, some of the more revealing stuff. Uh, we talked about Jarrett Stidham. He said he doesn't think he's reached his full potential yet uh, and that they still think they can improve upon what we saw last season. So still some Stidham talk. They don't view him any differently than they did a year ago. Uh, so not a broad enough sample size last year. Uh, maybe that's a negative, though, Scott, because he's been in the building for a year and they're not any higher on him. Uh, so obviously they were pretty they high on him last year, though. I mean, they, last they year they talked good. him up. This year they're not. You know, uh, so now talk you're the starter. You're the quarterback number one. Now you're going to get the, yeah, the starting quarterback treatment where you know we basically ignore you. <laughs> yeah, I uh, did talk about you know not paying a quarterback just to pay a quarterback, and that they liked Stidham enough. So I think that's kind of in relation to like Brissett and Darnold, who the Broncos yeah. were linked with, which is not. Did we talked about on here? I mean, they might just simply like Stidham in that category where given how much backup quarterbacks got this cycle, nobody received better benefit from the cap exploding than the backup quarterback market. Uh, so Stidham's in that category. But the Nick, most... Real quick on that point, yeah. I, I said this last night, it, it just, it never made sense to me. And I, I feel like there's either, you know, people either don't know what they're doing or it's intellectual dishonesty. One of the two, when you start using the, the, the discussion that the Broncos didn't do anything in the quarterback market, I can't believe they weren't more active. I'm like, they, they got their bridge last year. If Jared Stidham was a free agent this year and you signed him, what would you say his role is? He is your bridge starter. That's who they went and got. A veteran quarterback with some time in the league. 
with some upside. This is who they got, Jarrett Stidham. Well, they got him last year. They signed him to a multi-year deal to be that guy. So, again, I, I feel like there's <laughs> it's either incompetence or intellectual dishonesty when you start throwing those narratives out there. Which one do you want to choose? Neither one of them are all that flattering. Yeah. And it might be that kind of year uh, for the Broncos. We'll see what happens, but they like Stedman enough that he is still here. Uh, other big things from Sean Payton in the interview, he took a uh, not-so-subtle shot at uh, Russell Wilson again. So if you're Russell Wilson fans, and I think a lot of the Russell Wilson fan folks have kind of uh, trickled their way out because it's obviously a Broncos podcast, not a Russell Wilson podcast. Uh, but uh, Peyton said uh, to score more points, the Broncos have to do what? And Peyton, Peyton said, number one thing, we can't take as many sacks. And we talked about it on here a lot. It's a big reason that I think the Justin Fields market was so low and that uh, Wilson is gone. It's really hard to keep the opposing defense guessing when you are in third and longs and getting off script, you need to be getting working your way to those third and shorts and heck second and shorts. So you can have some burn down so you can take some shots uh, vertically. So taking the sacks is something that obviously we talked about a lot on here as an issue with Russell Wilson, taking the sacks too, when guys are open and you're supposed to just, you know, trust the read and fire it in there. Maybe you're not seeing it. I don't know. Uh, but the, that's the number one thing that Sean Payton said was uh, walking away this off season was how do we improve the offense? We take less sacks. So looking at this, you know, as far as taking the sacks, uh, StatMuse does it. They'll put it in. A, we talk about line graphs, but this is a bar graph. So it gives you the same similar type of linear look on this. And the Broncos finished sixth last year with the six most sacks with 52. And there's definitely tiers in there where between 47 and 52 is anywhere from six to 10. And then there it's kind of steady. So the line between being almost 20th is 10 sacks where the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers only gave up 40. The Falcons on less dropbacks only gave up 40. The Cowboys only gave up 40. Then there were four, two, three, four, and five that gave up 65 or 64 sacks. So another 12 jump up to the next one. That was Washington Commanders, Panthers, Jets, and Titans. Then way up here all by themselves was the New York Giants with 85 sacks that is unbelievable tommy DeVito yes special. i can absolutely see why the new york giants take joe alt at number six a lot of that was uh court i think sacks are more quarterback stat than an offensive not 85 stat. of them brother not 85 if you look at the pressure to sack rate <laughs> it 85 is, of them I, no I, I how much tommy devito did you watch last year uh, I watched, I think, two games of him play. He was, okay. you know, okay. Because they do really they count much... RPOs. Do they count run, you know, run options a as a tackle for loss? Do they count those as sacks? Yes. That's silly. Okay. If it's behind the line of scrimmage, then yeah. Yeah, that's um, stupid. Well, they don't, they it's count. It's not to... a pass right out of the gate. It's not a sack. It's a tackle for loss. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of it is the quarterback there. You can look at the pressure to sack ratio. Tommy DeVito took an unbelievable amount of sacks uh, last year. Now, I do agree with you, The especially Evan Neal. He struggled at tackle, and there's a reason that they are maybe looking at tackle there. But it sounds like quarterback and wide receiver are way higher uh, for the Giants in terms of how they're trying to build this team um, sitting there at six. Maybe that's just the caliber of players that are available. Yeah, uh, if, but I do, if I sort by rate, Denver actually came in third. Dallas Cowboys were number one at 105, and Baltimore was number two at 103 which I don't really understand what that is because that's not a percentage. Uh, Denver Bronco was third most by rate. So I'll have to figure out what that is. It doesn't totally make sense on that. But again, if you all want to see this, I'll drop it in the chat real quick. Uh, on StatMuse, that line graph that I like to see because it really illustrates the tiers that we talk about. Well, we were fifth most. Yeah, but you were one sack away from being second or 10th. You weren't way up here by themselves. So again, if you're using tackles for losses and sacks based on a running play with your quarterback, that's just dumb. Not as dumb as college football using sacks in the pass game as rushing yards for the quarterback, but that's a different conversation. Yeah, pressure to sack rate. So the Broncos, I mean, struggled last year there as far as the ability for the quarterback to negate pressures into sacks. And the best two quarterbacks in football over the last five years at pressure to sack are Mahomes and Allen. So that's 
pretty valuable stat, honestly, for evaluating quarterbacks at the NFL level. Not sure how translatable it is from the NFL college to the NFL. Uh, but those guys, uh, Stidham was 25%. Russell Wilson was 20, uh, 20%. And those are really high. And then you scroll down to the Giants and you have Tommy DeVito at 37.4% of his pressures resulting in sacks and Daniel Jones at 31. So, I mean, the, the offensive line was an issue, Scott. Don't get me wrong. But the they are crazy outliers. Yeah. It's it's it has to be, but when you're that far, yeah, it's both. But you it's, can still see why they might be interested in Joe Alt mm-hmm. at left tackle. Yep. New York Giants. Uh Andrew Thomas is so good at left tackle. He'd probably play right tackle. Honestly, the issue isn't Andrew Thomas. It was Evan um, Neal has been a big Evan Neal's the issue. Yes. Mm-hmm. Evan Neal is the problem. Um, they probably he's he'd probably be a good guard. Uh Jess Canady coming in and said, Did you guys watch the Colin and Nick's interview? I did. Uh Nick seems very uh, well-spoken and like an adult, you know, that's what you get with a 24 year old quarterback. Uh, he's definitely seen some things and, uh, he's been in the, the spotlight for a while. High recruit quarterback. Um, uh, father was a college quarterback too at Auburn. So, I mean, he's, I mean, his you know, dad was a high school football coach for a long time too. And he may have gotten a sniff and for some reason, I think he was at Sanford or something as a quarterback's coach, but his dad ended up being a, a, a really successful high school football coach too. So, um, Nix is a coach's kid, has grown up in and around big time football and played big time football. He's gonna check all the boxes when it comes to to character. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I thought it was good, but I mean, I've enjoyed listening to all these guys talk. Honestly, I've listened to all the podium sessions from these quarterbacks. They're very well coached and they all seem like smart kids. Uh so we will see what happens there. Scott, I don't know if it's my internet that's starting to poop out a little bit. It's mine. It's yours? Okay. My connection to StreamYard is down to a dot. Okay. Uh, final thing here before we get on out of here uh, with the Mike, or not, excuse me, the Sean Payton uh, talking at the owner meeting. He did mention that the Broncos were at attendance, obviously, with uh, JJ McCarthy at the Michigan Pro Day and that the Broncos spent four or five hours with them afterwards and uh, spent time on the whiteboard. So, I mean, obviously they're going to do that with a lot of guys. I think it's kind of funny. Sean Payton mentions that where he started the interview saying, I'm not going to talk about any specific prospects here. And then he talks about McCarthy. <laughs> so I don't know. Sean likes to talk. Um, maybe this is smokescreen. Maybe it's just him, you know, sitting back and you know, spitting out there, whatever comes to mind. But uh, the Broncos have obviously spent some time with uh, McCarthy and are evaluating. Not, not shocking, but interesting that he brings it up. Yeah, I mean, realistic. Yeah, it is realistic to move up. It's going to be expensive. Yep. It's going to be expensive. So I want you all to think about this, and we'll we'll talk more about it when we come back. How much is too much to move up to get one of the top four? To get J.J. McCarthy. Let's say he's the fourth quarterback in this. What would you give up, give up to move up to four with the Arizona Cardinals to get J.J. McCarthy? Because it's probably going to cost you three firsts at least, or the equivalent thereof. Is that too much? Is it not more on Thursday? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'm not going to have time for the mock draft Monday today. We'll do mock draft Monday on Thursday. Uh, that'll be fine. Um, we always won't have a Sean Payton interview to go off of. So that's fun. And yeah, gosh, we're going to have a lot of time here. It was, we're one month away from the, the draft, Scott. So that'll be exciting. I know we're kind of Broncos are very, you know, Blind, Broncos country blinders on the quarterback conversation, but we'll see right now. If I had to guess, I think the most likely thing that happens is that the Broncos trade back from 12 and accumulate a little bit more assets and then reevaluate the quarterback market at pick 16 through 25 range. I think somebody is going to come up and I think they're going to come up for an offensive tackle and the Broncos will end up moving back. I, I, I don't have a feel for it. I think trading back would be great. It makes sense. Staying at 12, if you like Bo Nix, makes sense. And Sean Payton is not a patient man. So giving up too much to move up makes sense also. So I'm split. I don't know what the Denver Broncos will do. We can give you options. If they do this, this is what it's going to cost. This is who they're going to go after. If they stay put, these are the guys they can target. If they trade back, this is what they should get and who they can target in this area too. But what they're going to do, man, all options are on the table. Yeah, nice I, having a top 12 pick again for it's been a, been a while, Nick. It's been a while since yeah. since we've been able to talk first round picks here. It just really smells like f- from what I'm picking up here from the Broncos, they do like Bo Nix, but they don't like him at 12. 
And it's very much lining up like there is so much Drew Locke to the Broncos hype. And you'd see him pretty consistently mocked to the Broncos at 10, but not mocked to anybody else. And if he wasn't mocked to the Broncos at 10, then he, you weren't seeing him go until like pick 28. And then the Broncos trade back twice and end up getting locked still. Yeah, That's think- how it's lining up to me now. Everything's different, but and we're very much looking for patterns. What we've seen historically. That's just how the human brain works. But I do think the Broncos like Knicks. I don't think it's a 12 conversation. I just, from who I've spoken with and what I'm hearing, I don't think that's the case. So yeah. they can still like him and they can we'll move see. back, but we'll see. We'll see. Again, trading back and getting getting Bo Nix would be ideal. What What's your number one trade scenario, Scott? That's it. Getting a quarterback and picking up a, at least another day two pick out of it. That would be ideal. Yep. Or a 20, 25 pick. Um, in the end, but uh, watch out for the the trademark. I, I love the second round in this draft. I absolutely love it. I think when I do the mocks that like the last 10 picks of the second round, I start to like grit my teeth a little bit, mm-hmm. but like the first half of the second round, especially at wide receiver, giddy up. Uh, I mean, God, this is it's pretty <laughs> great there. Offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Like you're talking the second round, Scott, but like the edge rushers second round. Yeah. Ugh, ugh, woof. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Um, We'll see what happens. A lot of fun today, guys. It is 8.30. I got stuff to do. It's Monday, so uh, we're going to get on out of here. Appreciate everyone coming in. Make sure you're following Scott and I on Twitter. Scott is at Scout Kennedy. I'm at Nick Kendall MHH. Also follow us at Mile High Huddle if you haven't done so. Facebook.com is a great place to find us. Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle and Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle Pod. Haven't given a shout out for a bit, but I know a lot of you folks, if you're busy like me trying to cram in everything, do multiple things at once, maybe you're not joining the live stream, but you're listening after the fact, even if you're not. Find us on Apple Podcasts, find Mile High Huddle, huddle up, and uh, give us a five-star review. That helps us a heck of a lot. And as the ticker says here underneath, please subscribe, like, and share over on your social media platforms uh, on the way out. If you think we've earned it, I see there's only 15 likes in here on the Facebook side. I think you're better than that. We're better than 15, so probably way more than that with the um, the other sides. Uh, want to give a shout-out to everybody who also came in and keep the lights on and make it where I can be like, Look, babe, we are making money on these shows. I can keep coming in and waking up at 5 a.m. and messing up with the uh, the sleep schedule a little bit. Uh, Oblivion Empire, thank you so much for the super chat. Mike Givens, David Cromello, Michael the Ronk Ronquillo, David again, Troy Boer, Mark Schrader, God bless you, Mark, Keith Brugman, Gary Kuhn, Gary Palmer, Rob Buxbaum, Lawrence Rivera, Jess Canady, and Coach Chris also coming in at the, at buzzer. the buzzer. The buzzer beater. It's March Madness, <laughs> Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. He says, love you guys. Have a great weekend. Well, it's a little early to celebrate the weekend, but I'm going to anyway. Now that you said it, coach, it's Monday. I'm manifesting a great weekend. When um, I was in college, my, my weekend started on Monday night. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> those were the days, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. There were six, six day weekends in the old Kennedy house. God bless. I wish that was a thing, but I'd be hiking or something. So appreciate everyone. Um, no Tuesdays for now because uh, I'm having a. Uh, I'm happy to be here for right now um, with every with everything and the the sleep schedule and whatnot. So I'm not ignoring you guys, but uh, I don't have the ability to do that right now without uh, making Getting some divorce. Yeah, I don't want anybody. I know I'd rather have. I don't love you guys upset at me, but I don't live with you guys, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Um, well, we are six times per week between the two of us. So, yes. you know, we go, we take, cause Nick's on Tuesday nights. I am on then, Tuesday then, night. then we go Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Nick's on Tuesday nights and we go twice on Mondays. So if you're wondering where we are on Mondays, how come you're five minutes late? Come see us on youtube.com slash Scott Kennedy. You'll know when we're going to be here. Cause we'll be saying goodbye over there. Yeah. Appreciate everyone. Uh, have a great Monday. Uh, continue to choose kindness, and compassion. And as always go Broncos. <laughs>